Great. Um, so uh, I'm happy to have you here today. Um, I'm Veronica, head of local chapters in Umdena, and we're today doing an interview with Rich Gregson. Uh, and he um, he's rewarded with uh, this interview because uh, he conducted did a really great project in local chapters. Uh, it was actually his first project, uh, but we are really happy to share his experiences, his tactics, and um, everything that you may want to know. Um, cool. Hello, Rich. Hello, pleasure to be here. Great, and um, pleasure to have you. <laughs> so um, we can start with very beginning, like... Um, yeah you you have this experience of the project and basically i wanted to ask you first how did you choose this project how did you decide on on a specific topic because i know that a lot of times leads struggle to to choose their project yeah well before i even applied to be a lead i had a number of different projects in mind um I worked on a, a project through Ondina um, for Philadelphia chapter and really enjoyed it. So I thought, you know, I think I could could run a, a project and, you know, I applied for the lead in Liverpool. Um, so I already had about three different project ideas. Um, this, you know, we, I, I chose this particular one only because um, looking through the media in, in and around the UK, it seemed that there was quite a lot of road traffic accidents that were, you know, ended up being fatal and quite serious. Now, I noticed that there was a lot of them. That might just be my confirmation bias, but I thought to myself, wouldn't it be interesting to, to take a look um, at, at the statistics? Let's take a look at the records that are provided by, you know, various different sorts of uh, departments of the government and try and maybe come up with a solution um, that we could, you know, that, that, that would be multifaceted. Maybe we could draw some insights that could um, help local governments um, improve their road network in their particular jurisdiction and maybe build a model that based on the information that um, the government has that could predict the severity of accidents and see if we could find any sort of hotspots where these accidents happened um, more frequently than not. And, you know, I think, you know, people I know have, have been involved in serious accidents. I know a couple of people who have actually lost their lives in, in these accidents. So I thought it would be a good um, project to work on, not only because it, it, it will be quite interesting for, you know, people of, of all experience levels, but, you know, it, it, it does have a personal sort of connotation to it as well, which I, I thought, you know, would be interesting to explore. Great. And uh, have you had in mind, like, if, if there is any, any open data on that? Because um, I know on a lot of projects, there is a struggle about data, especially open source. Yeah. Well, that's one of the biggest problems of being a, a data scientist. It's sourcing the data. Um, a lot of clients usually have massive amounts of data, but don't really know what to do with it. So um, fortunately for this one, though, it was quite easy. Um, the Department of Transport in the UK um, have a open data platform and they have, um, you know, quite extensive data sets from, a, you know, a, a range of different um, subjects. And one of them is, is, is road traffic collisions. And the data that they have um, it ran from, I think it was 2005 to 2017. And these are police accident reports and also um, self-reporting um, forms as well. So it's a mixture of, of you know, authority, um, monitor, you know, trying to explain the circumstances around um, a, a road traffic collision, where it happened, what the weather was like and, and whatnot. Um, but it's also data that's collected from members of public as well who've been in accidents and, you know, it, more likely than not a slight accident. And they've, um, you know, completed a self, self-accident self report form um, with their local police force. So it was available. Um, and we actually pulled two data sets uh, the first data set was the actual instance of a, a, 
um, and accidents that happened. Um, and it was and they're assigned accidents index numbers. And the second set of data was the um, information about the vehicles that were involved within those accidents. And they are linked with a primary key being the accidents index. Um, there was a lot of duplications in the vehicle index, but that was absolutely expected because more often than not, there's more than one vehicle involved. So it was quite um, it was quite interesting to see the kind of vehicles um, involved in, in, in the accidents and even the number. I think one of the, the highest accidents that we, you know, there was 53 vehicles involved in one accident um, and it was a mass pile up on, on, on a motorway. So, you know, it was quite interesting data. But yeah, we, we use two data sets, accidents information and vehicle data as well. So you already approached the project, approached the project, uh, having the data like prepared for your collaborators. Yeah, um, the data isn't wasn't great to be honest with you. There, there was a number of, um, you know, we we did have to go, go through quite an extensive pre-processing, um, and I did leave a few little tricks in there for the beginners to see if they could identify it because it's all about learning, um, and you know the data was already available. It's now on Kaggle. Um, but, you know, I took a, a, a decent time frame. So we went, you, you know, the, because it was aimed at beginners, I didn't really want to struggle with the data collection. It would have been an easy task, but I wanted to hit the floor running um, and provide, you know, the, the, the beginners of the project with a nice but not friendly data set because you know there's there's no fun in that part 90 percent of the funds in wrangling the data and that's what i wanted to show to the beginners so you know the, it, it wasn't an easy ride but you know i didn't i didn't want them to worry about actually collecting the data themselves and what do you mean i uh, like problematic data what was this uh tasty well <laughs> there was you know some of the key information um in terms of where the roads were located uh, the type of roads that the accidents were on, um, you know, I removed some of that data purposely um, just to see how they would, you know, what what their, you know, sort of techniques of, of how to solve that issue was. And it's, you know, it, it opened the door to, to, to numerous learning experiences. So it was little things like that. Nothing to, I mean, the data was sort of incomplete when I got it, but I just made it that little bit more interesting. So we would have to try and use, you know, numerous different techniques of data imputation, for example, um, when really the fresh data from the government, you could probably only use one. Um, but, you know, let, let's let's try and learn as many tools as we can and as many techniques as we can while working on the project. I think that would, you know, it, it was my idea that that would benefit beginners a lot more. Okay, so to summarize that part about the, the project, you uh, started it as personal interest. You didn't start with like, uh, okay, what projects are out there? What things? It was just like, okay, there are many accidents and uh, you had experience with data science. So you knew that there is a connection between this problem and solving it. And then um, you kind of um, took in in consideration uh, what kind of volunteers will be there, what kind of uh, collaborators, and you started to look for, for data sets, um, open source in uh, governmental website, right? Yeah, and then, that's right. Um, you kind of looked through it and prepared it for the exercise for these people. Yeah. So um, I think yeah, that's, I, I, that's a really great lesson. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I didn't want a, a nice, clean data set that people had already worked on quite extensively. Um, I wanted to, you know, bring something quite fresh and new. Um, there, have, there have been numerous scientific papers published using the same data set. Um, but again, it, you know, there's not many, you know, what I could find anyway, there wasn't any established sort of data science projects using this particular data set. So, you know, the beginners on this project were going in completely blind. There was no sort of resources out there to handle this type of data. And I think that overall did benefit them. And, you know, I'll go into that a bit later on. Okay, great. So moving on to another aspect, um, as it was your first project of your first chapter, 
you kind of needed to get this ball rolling uh, in your community. So how did you uh, approach marketing a volunteer open source project in data science? Yeah. So on my, it, most of the recruitment was done through LinkedIn. Um, and, you know, I, on LinkedIn, I've got quite a, quite a, a large following, um, especially in the uh, machine learning, data science sort of community. So it was making regular posts there, Twitter, Instagram, um, and just trying to capture engagement. Um, another benefit was that I had worked on previous a previous Omdina project, and I was the machine learning lead, um, you know, throughout that project. So I, I did make some friends during that project who were interested in working again um, with me on 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 a different project. So when I you know, found out I, I was able to be a a, um, a chapter lead. I contacted them and said, "Listen, I've got a I've got a project that I'm thinking of doing. It's based on this. Would you would you be interested in joining?" And you know, I'd say about seventy percent of the people who had worked in did have the time to come over and work on our project. So, you know, we did we did push it. Um, one of the um, the, the, the lead. Um, and the development, learning and development lead, Salman, um, he's also got quite a influential uh, LinkedIn and he brought, a, you know, he made posts. He talked about it on a couple of videos we've done on our YouTube channel. And um, he did, you know, be a, you know, he was able to, to make a few posts and get a good few applicants based on his posts. That were, and, and a number of them were, were brand new to Omdina as well, which was was which was nice bringing them in. You know, they weren't aware of Omdina and the fantastic work it does. So, you know, we introduced them not only to our project but only to, as well to the Omdina platform. Um, so yeah, it was just it was just hammering the the social media really that 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 got us a good turnout, and we did have you know a good number of applicants, and you know, a lot of people turned up to the the kickoff meeting mm -hmm. and we were very happy about that and throughout the project the engagement we had was absolutely fantastic yeah yeah like you got a lot of applicants and you got a great engagement that's also why we are talking today yeah <laughs> um so if um anyone would like to learn more of the message that you were spreading while you were marketing like maybe you now have uh one minute 30 seconds to like again market project how would you do it to the person that doesn't know about Omdena and um, maybe is afraid of a volunteer project or bottom-up collaboration yeah I think um, the key point about Omdena is that what I wanted to iterate to the beginners on my project was that it's a safe space whether you're a beginner whether you're intermediate whether you're an expert an Omdina project, especially one designed for beginners, is somewhere where you can make the mistakes, where you can learn. You can ask the silly questions. No one is judging. Everyone is in the same boat. And especially when you're at the start of your data science career, if you've got no place to ask these sort of questions, you know, to, to, to learn yourself, you, you know, you're not going to build up that confidence it's the confidence of asking the you know questions. It's the confidence of being wrong. There's nothing wrong with that. It you know you need to be wrong to learn. You know, and it's not an easy ride. Data science, machine learning, engineering. It's a very technical role. And even now, people who've worked you know in the in the industry for five, ten years, they still ask questions. You can't master it at all. But what I think would you know what I would have loved. Um, to know about Omdina when I first started my my career, it would have saved me a lot of time. It would have put me in a room with people who were on this in the same boat, on the same level, with people who know a lot about machine learning and data science, and you know are not judgmental. You know, I'm, mm. if I ask a stupid question, I'm not going to lose my job over it. If I make a mistake, I'm not going to lose the job. It's just part of the learning with Omdina, and I think that is one of the most important facets about Omdina is that it is a safe space for education. Um, and it, you know, it, it is really beneficial, especially if you're starting out in, in your data science career. So my marketing took that approach. It, it, you know, it wasn't so much look at this interesting project. It was like, if you want to excel in your career and have something for your portfolio and learn how to work with a team on a project, and this team is based all around the world. So you have to take into, you know, into account like sort of time differences and things like that. It really helps you 
understand what a real life data science and machine learning um, role in the in industry is like. And that was the biggest sort of message I wanted to give during the market and, and during the initial phases within within the um, the project as well. Well, it looks like it worked. <laughs> So, it did, yeah, uh, it did. It, it it worked really well, and I think um, I think the message got across, um, and that's you know one of the reasons why I think we um, we did have that good engagements and sustained engagements as well. Yeah, yeah, I think like um, initial message is very important because maybe other people would subscribe, but if they heard something else uh, and they wouldn't get that in the end, they would stop being engaged, but. Their promise was to ask questions and learn, and they got that. So that's why they yeah. stayed till the end. I think uh, um, that's really important to like clear it out in the beginning to to make um, why you're here, what what you can gain, and and things like that. Absolutely. Um, and it also reminds me of uh, the first time we had the talk, and you told me that you found out about Omdena because you were searching for like collaborative projects in, in AI and you couldn't find something like that elsewhere. And I see that you really, mm, really use that in, in your like project management techniques because I saw you were organizing workshops that were mm -hmm. exactly like based on collaboration between people. And I think that's, that's also a great lesson for, for other leads or other yeah. even project managers. <laughs> Yeah, it the the workshops um, that were around the project um, were designed for beginners, because you know I've been a beginner, and you know every day I learn more and more. And sometimes you can be you can feel overwhelmed if you're collaborating with people who know more than you. You can feel overwhelmed in trying to pick up what they you know what they're trying to say, what they're showing, you know their coding and things like that. So the idea was. You know, if we, you know, the first week, for example, was data pre-processing. Now that was picked up with by people who did have some, you know, intermediate knowledge about how to pre-process data. Um, the beginners, you know, we, we we met regularly. We explained all the processes behind it. But when you're in like a team meeting, you don't want to eat up everyone's time. So outside of these team meetings, we had the workshops where Salman Khalik would go through every single piece of data pre-processing that we'd already done in the team meeting so the beginners could understand it thoroughly thoroughly and not feel as if they're left behind and i think that was really beneficial um as i say it's very easy to be overwhelmed in especially in a very highly technical role um and i think you know having that sort of educational space away from the project not only sort of bolstered the participants knowledge but it also made future meetings a lot more digestible so they could you know they could follow along a lot better and they could get to grips with the sort of techniques that we were using a lot better and you know the feedback that we had for these these um sort of workshops was fantastic and they done exactly what we wanted them to do and i think you know there's a number of of, of beginners in the project that by week five they personal transformation was you know was easy to see that they went from knowing you know very minimal python at all to being able to complete a notebook about pre-processing and understand everything that they've done and that just goes to show how beneficial it was to have those sorts of side workshops along you know with that that ran concurrently to the um the project so yeah it was really beneficial and i would definitely recommend it if if a project does have the time and the, and the participants have the time to do that go for it. it it is really beneficial especially for the beginners so you would rather recommend a person not to learn python lesson by lesson but just jump in on the yeah the well i mean it that doesn't it doesn't work for everyone that way it works for me um I, you know i'm one of them people who will just jump in both feet at the deep end and see if I can find my way out. And that's how I learn Python. That's how I've learned pretty much everything I've ever done um, in terms of data science and machine learning. It doesn't work for everyone at all. Um, you know, every, everyone knows how they like to learn. But, you know, having these workshops that took you from pretty much ground level to being able to 
produce a notebook and understand every technique you've used was very b- beneficial. Um, but yeah, I don't endorse jumping in head first. Um, that's just how I do it. Um, but you know, it, it is, it's, it's worth a go and see what happens. Um, just immerse yourself in it. That's how you pick up technical skills in this role is, is it's practice. It's constant practice and, and immersion it within um, the particular industry that you want to learn. Mm. Yeah, I think I think that's also a great recommendation for others. And um, so you, let's imagine that there's like the first meeting of your project. I'm really interested to know, like, how do you approach these beginners from from the very first time? Like, hey, I'm here. I actually saw that project. And I'm interested to contribute, but I don't even know how I can contribute. So yeah, yeah. See, that was a big challenge. Um, on the kickoff meeting, you have to ensure that the beginners feel welcome. Um, imposter syndrome is a really big thing, and I get it to this day. And being a beginner with little or no experience of, of AI, machine learning, and data science in general, imposter syndrome will be, you know, if it's overwhelming, they'll just leave the the, the, the program. And so my, my initial kickoff meeting, it was, it was all focused about the beginners. It's, you know, how the project is going to run start to finish, how it's going to be managed, um, who are the sort of... Um, the people that you know can be contacted i'm the project lead salman kali was the learning and development manager so all you know beginner questions and you know any sort of problems at all will be managed by us um you can ask any sort of questions as i said earlier there's no stupid questions we're here to learn um and that and the only way you can do that is by asking these questions and i think setting particular roles within the um the initial kickoff you know let them know about the task leads and the co uh, task leads and the co leads and also um encouraging people to sort of do the research as well so when we come to you know for example the, the modeling aspect it wasn't just okay we're you know it's modeling week now you need to go away and model things we give resources we give tutorials we give um, again. We done the, the the side sort of um, uh, workshops, but I think giving people a role and making them understand that even asking questions is contribution. So, for example, we had you know the EDA phase. People were producing their own EDA, um, and we you know had thirty different styles of EDA and what you know loads of different insights. And even if a beginner wasn't comfortable in producing an EDA notebook, what we sort of try to say is ask questions about other people's EDA. Maybe there's something that they have missed that you have picked up on. You know, have they looked at a certain uh, feature? How about looking at that feature and stratifying it in in age groups or, you know, a, a number of different cohorts, even asking questions, which, you know, allows people to edit their own work that's a contribution because you could by asking that question you could discover something that hasn't been discovered so even if they're not comfortable coding it themselves jump in the slack channel ask questions join us on the team and ask questions about the about what what work has gone on and it is that you know and maybe a notifiers about a perhaps a different way of looking at things all that is genuine and valid contribution um especially when you're working in a large team um, it could, you know, a, a good question could change the complete outlook of a particular piece of work. So that that was what was encouraged that, you know, by contribution, we don't just mean presenting your notebook know, and sending some work. We want contribution. We want discussion. We want to, um, you know, explore every different avenue and the benefits of having fresh eyes on a particular work, on a particular piece of work. You know, it, it, it really comes in handy. So, yeah contribution was not just you know hard coding or you know modeling results and experimentation it was simply getting involved asking questions about what had already been done and maybe thinking about what we could do in the future as well so i think that's very important especially for beginners engagements um is ensuring that they feel 
their presence presence is valuable, and because it is, um, you know, as I say, a pair of fresh eyes on a, on a task is is fantastic, especially when you've gone down the rabbit hole of data pre processing and whatnot. Um, so yeah, I think that for me, if you know, if it was to do it again, I'd I'd stick with that, making sure the beginners feel belong. So you were mostly using Slack for that, and you were having meetings how often? Uh, we were meeting twice a week, um, a Wednesday and a Saturday. The Wednesday meeting was sort of a catch-up um, where we could discuss various different techniques we've tried, what worked, what didn't work, any suggestions from the group um, about things that they may have thought of, and we could implement that and, and see how that went. And the Saturday meeting was was you know, presenting the final week's work um, and, you know, and thinking about the next steps. But in between that, um, some of the participants met up, you know, other, you know, had calls other times about data, just to discuss their ideas with, with, with each other in the, in the group. And that was fantastic. The Slack channel was really busy. And I think that was our number, you know, that's pretty much the number one communication channel. Not only can you share the notebooks, it was, you know, it was active. We were getting about 50 to 100 messages a day in between the meetings about, you know, the sort of work that we were doing. So, you know, if, if someone didn't have the confidence to, to go live in one of the meetings and share their work, they could just post their notebook or post their questions and the whole group would, would answer. Um, they give some construct, constructive criticism or, you know, and, and show them how to do it maybe in a more efficient way or whatnot. So I think... The Slack as well, you know, that sort of platform where we could have everyone engage engaging within the work was was absolutely paramount of paramount importance to the project as well, outside of the meetings. Okay. So to summarize that part, it would be like uh in the beginning, you need to ensure that the beginners are welcome and you kind of make that kickoff a little more directed to them so you don't lose them. And yeah. uh, then you kind of ensure that there is this community uh, engagement of the people. So they are connected to each other. They they want to get to know each other and share the knowledge, even beginners, mm -hmm. experts. And, and one of the ways to do that is organizing workshops or the task leader groups, and then they can do that together. Um, yeah. And have you done something like uh, live coding sessions so people can do just like from observing? Yeah, we've done. Um, I mean, that was sort of part of the um, the workshops as well. It was a live code along. It wasn't just look at this notebook. It's done. <laughs> um, it was actually built from scratch so they could see exactly the sort of thought processes and what the code was. Um, and yeah, again, that really benefits. Um, and it was, you know, it was hosted live on youtube and the video recordings are always there for their reference as well and um you know it's it, it the engagement we got out of them was really beneficial and as i said before the feedback was fantastic as well it really helped a good few people uh, understand the concepts that were happening within the project yeah that's that's really great like it was really outstanding long-term engagement and i think the, the the things that we just mentioned were were really important to keep that up uh, you didn't need to promise them uh, mostly like precious things in the end but the journey was the thing that was motivating for them mm -hmm. um that's that's really yeah. inspiring <laughs> i really like that so um the other thing is like how like what motivated you to to be a lead like uh, it's a huge um it, it looks like it's a huge engagement also from your side and i understand that you also have a different work so i i know that a lot of times it's um very uh challenging for leads to mm -hmm. be that engaged with the project but also uh, with their own life uh things yeah it was sort of a, a two-sided um coin for me um in one respect, it was good for me in terms of my project management skills, my mm -hmm. time management skills, um, and, you know, making sure, you know, that, that, that sort of, you know, it, a lot of personal self-development, I, I think, um, is, is part of, of why I wanted to become a chapter lead. The second part really was, as I said, you know, at the start of my career, 
nothing like Omdine had existed. So it was really difficult for me to build a portfolio, learn the skills that was required. Um, of course, I worked in the industry. I, I worked, you know, was a data analyst for ten years, um, eight years before I become a data scientist. Um, but again, there was in the particular roles I had, there wasn't much room for um, expanding that skill set. So part of becoming a chapter lead was to help those people who were in the same position as me. They might be in a, um, you know, an entry level data um, analytics role. Uh, they might be wanting to move into data analytics or data science from a different um, uh, industry completely. And I think being part of their sort of develop, you know, lifelong development, getting them to it, you know, uh, you know, it's it's easy to sit there and do online courses. It's very easy to do that, and you can learn a lot from it. But if you don't apply them skills, it, you know, your skills don't have context, and that's why I thought, you know, I'd like to be, I'd like to give these beginners the context to what they've learned already off online courses and there's no better way than actually doing something contributing to a project that actually takes a real life shape and can be used in real life not and you know so for me again it was my personal development in terms of my project management skills uh, my speaking skills trying to you know explain concept sort of um techniques to a a layman aud audience that is also a skill in itself. Um, but also, I'd like to help beginners get onto the ladder in their career. I want the, you know, to contribute to get them getting there to where they want to be. And I think you know, that meant a lot to me. And the feedback that I got was, was very welcome. And I hope uh, um, at the end of the project, the people that worked with me um, you know, have, have gained a lot and will go on to achieving their their goal their dream of you know working in, in the data science industry yeah i think that is really important to think of because i think many times uh, people approach these projects more in a way that uh, we want to produce something that's needed and we're going to make it live and real and and implement it all the way but actually you mentioned many more things that can be goals and are actually goals of these open source uh, great projects that mm -hmm. are like from your side, a chapter lead is, is learning a lot of uh, also soft skills, uh, great skills for their development, even if they're not so technical. But of course, you can also learn technical things. Yeah. Uh, that's probably one of the funny things that you can find out during uh, maybe some simple projects or even the project that is outside of the domain that you're normally working with, you yeah. can really find out the um, things that you never heard of or uh, learn from other people randomly. Yeah, that, no, definitely. There's, you know, the data science is so vast. You cannot possibly in one lifetime learn it all. And every, you know, being a data scientist, being an, a machine learning engineer, if you stay in that, you know, you're going to learn from as soon as you start until the day you die, you will learn something new every day. It's impossible to master. There's just so much. And yeah, even experienced people, if they join, you know, what seems to be a beginner friendly project, they might use a technique that they've never had to use before. And it's again, a learning curve for, for the more experienced as well, which, you know, I think staying one of the most important things about being in data science is staying curious. If you don't like learning, you won't make it in data science. Every day you need to learn. And what really helps more than anything is having that curiosity and that propensity to learn more every day. Um, they are the two key skills. Tech skills, you can learn. Soft skills, you can learn. But what drives you is your curiosity and ability, you know, your your appetite for new knowledge. That's what drives you. Everything can be learned except that. That has to be, you know, that has to be inside. And that is the key, I think, to, to, to sort of become successful in this particular domain. Yeah. I think it's it's a magic ingredient, the curiosity. Like yeah. maybe there are people uh, that want to learn code, but then they have a hard time uh, 
to approach that. But there's this spark that sometimes just comes in your way and you just become curious and you can spend like hyper focused hours on yeah. researching one yeah. thing. Well, that's it. It's, it's to me the coding part. It can be quite boring, but it's to me, I see it as a game. I've got a certain goal I want to reach and I, I have to put the puzzle together of the code. And it's that satisfaction of it's like when you finish a jigsaw and you like you stand back and look at it. It's the same sort of feeling. The code itself isn't, you know, it, it's not glamorous. But when you get to that end product of all that, you know, you've spent two weeks trying to code something together and it comes together. It's that feeling of satisfaction that makes it worthwhile if you know what I mean. But there, are, there has been times where you feel like you, th- you need to throw your laptop out the window. Absolutely <laughs> happens all the time. But as long as you can stay sort of passionate about the end game, it's fine. You'll learn it. You'll pick it up. Yeah, it'll be frustrating, but you'll get through it. Yeah. I think it takes one moment that you just experience this uh, proudness and, and yeah. accomplishment, and then it's going to take you like much further because before you experience that i guess it's the hardest but after the first time yeah yeah definitely definitely um and what would be the biggest learning of all that project experience so far um the biggest learning it would be probably that this i think the beginners will surprise you a lot um a lot of the beginners in our project, you know, worked in sort of technical roles before and um, not in terms of data science, but in, in, you know, maybe biology, finance and things like that. And it's actually really surprising how much soft skills can be transferred over to data science. And when you see, especially big, because, you you know, I've been in the industry for quite a while. And I, you forget about these things. But then when you see beginners applying knowledge that they've gained from a completely different industry into your project i think that is you know it really humbles you and you think you know if they really want this they can do it and they don't themselves don't realize that they have already a good foundation of knowledge which can be applied in data science um and i think it's that self-awareness i think it, it is a very important lesson for not only me but for everyone who wants to journey into data science as well and what could be like a simple example of such person that is maybe from another domain? And Well, we had like a, a time series analysis part of the project and the finance industry, that's all they do is, you know, predict <laughs> forecast finance and things like that. I'm not necessarily well versed in, in time series analysis. My history, uh, career history hasn't really necessarily um, led me down that path, but the, you know, so my, my, I wasn't an expert at that, but there was people who had worked in fact. Sorry, say again. Uh, what is it about? Like um, the time yeah. series analysis. We were what we were going to do was try and um, sort of predict in the future how many accidents took place, and you know I built a a very brief model of how to do it. But my knowledge is very limited in time series because I've never had to had to use it. I, I am aware of it, um, but I've never actually actually you know produce something, put something in production. Um, so there was people in our group that knew more about time series than I did. Um, and they were able to put together an, a, a decent model. And, you know, and it seemed to work quite well. It didn't give us, you know, any sort of new insights that we already knew. But it was good to see that someone on the team was able to use knowledge that they've gained elsewhere in a different industry and apply it to our particular project. Mm-hmm. So basically the learning is that um, be curious in people because they can surprise you and they can surprise themselves uh, what they can bring to your project. So absolutely, I think that can be really motivating even for people outside of the domain to try themselves and, and maybe try to apply their skills. And that is yeah. also connected to the imposter syndrome, I think, like, Maybe they have a ton of knowledge, but it's not in uh, data analysis, data science, and they yeah. don't feel like applying it. But in the end, it can be shocking. Absolutely. Definitely. Um, so as a last question, uh, what's next? So 
the next sort of phases we've got the uh, we produced a a nice um streamlet app and it has all our sort of insights it has information about the team that worked on the project and basically the people who have contributed are able to use this stream app as part of their portfolio as they have contributed. And it's still in development now. There's so much more that is getting added and getting up. Every time I load it up, <laughs> something else has changed on it, which is really good because people, that tells me that people were really engaged and really interested in what we were trying to achieve and they can further develop it to whatever they want it to do. Um, I believe people are, you know, going to attempt to write, you know, a real report about what happened, where the data come from, and hopefully get it published. That would be really interesting. Um, so the next phase is, in, is entirely up to the participants and where they want to take the solution. They've built a lot of skills uh, that they can now apply to various different subjects. And I think that is what is very important. In terms of what's next for the Liverpool chapter. <laughs> I've already got some ideas on the next project, which hopefully will begin at some point early next year. Um, but, you know, I'm not going to give too much away, but I think I've got some very interesting subjects that we could possibly uh, tackle. Um, but yeah, over the Christmas period, I'll be busy in work and stuff. So I haven't had, you know, a, a lot of time to, to put something together. But yeah, we'll be doing another project early next year. Um, but yeah, as I say, the, the, the project that we've already done, the insights are really, really valuable. And, you know, it could be possible that we could we could approach local authorities and say, listen, this is what we've done. What do you think about it? And, you know, is it of any use to you? Um, so, yeah, the, you know, the door has been left wide open um, in terms of, of what could be done to further improve the solution by the people who worked on it. Um, and as I say, the, the, the solution that we developed is fantastic and it's, it's in constant um, um, development. So it's, it is really interesting. But that's part of the, pro, the, the, the game. Data science is purely iterative. You can, you, know, it, you can just keep improving things and improving things and going back to the start and trying new things. And that's the beauty of it. And I think that's being really driven home with the, the people who, who participated in our project. So it's good to see. It's good to see. It's good to see that it's not the end and we are looking forward for the next chapters of the Liverpool chapter. Thank you very much for that conversation. It has a ton of uh, insights and tips and very interesting things. And yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to see what's going to be next. Yeah, it was a pleasure to be here and thanks very much for the opportunity. Couldn't have done it without Omdina. Thank you. Bye-bye. See you later.